November 5th, 1959, X-15 number two makes its third powered flight. There's a fire warning, and test pilot Scott Crossfield is forced to make an emergency landing. With the extra weight of unburned fuel and a hard emergency touchdown, the back of the X-15 breaks. Crossfield is okay. It's one of many close calls in an extraordinary program that will take man higher and faster than ever before. The Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum is the most visited museum in the world. Its collection contains some of the most important aircraft and spacecraft in history. Craft that were designed, built, and flown by men and women who have expanded the frontiers of flight. This is X-15 number one, the first in a series of three planes that conducted an extraordinarily successful test program from 1959 to 1968. The X-15 had two main objectives. It was designed to fly more than four times the speed of sound and climb so high that it would leave the atmosphere and enter space. The speed it would reach would generate enormously high temperatures, and the skin of all three planes in the series was made from a substance called Inconel X, able to withstand temperatures up to 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. Control surfaces would need to be enormously powerful. For flight outside the atmosphere, it had a set of reaction controls, using small jets to change the position of the plane out in space. When it was rolled out in late 1958, the X-15 was unlike anything ever built to fly. The idea of flying from the atmosphere out into space and back again wasn't new. In 1930s Germany, Dr. Eugene Sanger had proposed the idea of a rocket-powered bomber that was propelled into space and skipped on the atmosphere like a stone on a pond circling the Earth. But Scott Crossfield, who was a young test pilot in the early 1950s, has his own view on the early origin of the X-15 concept. I think that the X-15 originated on a fishing trip that I was on with Walt Williams. Uh, there are other people that think otherwise. But we were coming home from that fishing trip late at night, and two of our friends were asleep in the back seat, and they fired the 75,000-pound thrust Viking rocket at Santa Susana, and it was announced on the radio. And of course, immediately our imagination was sparked. What could we do with a manned airplane with a 75,000 pound thrust engine? And literally, we calculated what it should do on the back of an envelope that I dug out of his glove compartment. Since 1947, the X-Planes program had pushed speeds higher and higher toward Mach 2 and beyond. It was uncharted territory, with disastrous consequences waiting if maximum care was not taken. Everything we did in the research airplane program was, was kind of on the ragged edge of, of new knowledge, uh, whether it be the configuration or the altitudes or the speeds and that sort of thing. That was the purpose of it, to learn or experience these things that we thought we knew professionally. On December 12, 1953, almost the 50th anniversary of the Wright brothers' first flight, Chuck Yeager set out to fly the X-1A beyond Mach 2. As his speed increased to Mach 2.3, he ran into a phenomenon called roll inertia coupling, in which forces produced at speed and altitude become too strong for a control system to counteract. The result was a violent combination tumble, roll, and spin. He blacked out, but he was able to recover after dropping 50,000 feet in less than 50 seconds. Down to 25,000. I don't know where to get back to this. Huh? 
We knew it was directionally unstable at a speed below uh, what he planned to fly it. Uh, he thought he could handle it, and he couldn't. But it was no mystery that he might run into some kind of a stability problem because the wind tunnel data had shown it. And the X2, we definitely knew, was unstable above about 2.7 in Mach number. And they gave App, who'd never flown a rocket airplane before, a, a flight plan to fly in excess of Mach 3. Again, roll inertia coupling struck. At a speed over Mach 3 and an altitude of 60,000 feet, Captain Milburn Apt was subjected to alternating forces of plus and minus 6 Gs. Apt tried to regain control without success. He ejected, but was killed, and the plane destroyed. The X-15 was going to tackle much higher speeds and altitudes than either the X-1A or the X-2. Its control system would need to be powerful enough to overcome inertia coupling and whatever else lay in wait. So on the X-15, we decided that it would be inherently stable over the entire aerodynamic flight range, up to Mach 6, and that took that large vertical tail on the airplane. A typical X-15 altitude mission was planned to go like this. A B-52 carrying the X-15 would leave Edwards Air Force Base and fly to the top of what was known as X-15 high range at Wendover, Utah. The most sophisticated available electronics would monitor the X-15's ballistic trajectory. On return to the atmosphere, the X-15's outer skin would heat up particularly on the nose and the front edges of the wings and tail. The concept fascinated Scott Crossfield not just as a test pilot, but as an aeronautical engineer. I was determined that I was going to get involved in building and designing that airplane so that we no longer would have to have them all laid over cost and, and uh, under performance. That this was my personal goal, and so I left the NACA and went to work for North American. NACA had a major role in the development of the X-15. The Langley facility in Virginia was the major center of wind tunnel study, and its highly sophisticated equipment was used to the limit by the X-15 project. The X-15 would be an enormous leap in design. North American could not make that leap in complete darkness. Materials had to be tested for their ability to withstand extreme temperatures. Very few would qualify. It wasn't enough to test the airflow over the X-15 alone. North America needed to know how to best mate it with the B-52 launch airplane, and the flight characteristics of the pre-launch and launch phases were thoroughly tested in the wind tunnel. The X-15 would attempt speeds about three times anything already achieved in the atmosphere. Langley's hypersonic tunnel was challenged to the limit. A large-scale radio control model was used for drop tests in natural air conditions. It was carried up in a helicopter. When the model was dropped, its controlled descent was monitored and analyzed. But flying qualities were not the only problem. Major problem number one was to develop a throttleable rocket engine so we didn't have just a one-shot missile kind of an operation. With the other airplanes, we had four barrels, so we at least had four steps in thrust. The engine plan for the X-15 was the XLR-99 from the Reaction Motors Division of Thiokol. It was a development of the Viking rocket engine Scott Crossfield had been inspired by on his fishing trip. It would produce 57,000 pounds of thrust and be fully throttleable. Making an engine that big uh, that could be throttled was something that hadn't really been done for you before. Uh, when you throttle an engine that is cooled by the fuel, uh, 
the flow of fuel gets decreased and the heat input uh, gets decreased, but not quite as rapidly. So they had trouble uh, throttling it over uh, an appropriate range and still uh, keep it cooled properly. Just days after the X-15's construction began, Russia launched the first man-made satellite, Sputnik 1. It was a blow to American pride and to the X-15 philosophy of flying to space and back under pilot control. And there were delays with the XLR-99 engine. We found out early on that we weren't going to have an engine ready when the airplane was ready to go into flight test. There was a proposal to put LR-11 engines, two clusters of four barrels in the X-15, and I objected strenuously based on previous experience that when you go with an interim engine, you very often never see the main one. The X-15 was throwing up many new challenges. The pressure suit the pilots would wear had not only to work inside the cockpit, if the pilot had to eject, the suit would need to withstand extremely high speeds in the atmosphere. The suit was tested on a rocket sled at speeds up to a thousand miles an hour. People made uh, a problem of the safety and the escape capability. That became a major problem in the development of the airplane. Some people wanted to put capsules in it, which the airplane we, we never would have accomplished. In fact, most of the capsules we've ever made are just uh, used as a way to commit suicide to keep from getting killed, in my way of thinking, you know. I offered to fly the X-15 sitting on a tomato can if they'd just give me the money we'd pay for an escape system. <laughs> In the end, the designer settled for a straightforward ejection system. When the parachute opened, the pilot was pulled free of the seat assembly. Flying the X-15 would be an enormous physical challenge to the pilot, well before the X-15s were completed, Scott Crossfield and the two other initial pilots, Joe Walker of NACA and Bob White of the Air Force, spent many hours in the centrifuge. I probably have as much centrifuge time and pressure suit experimental time and pressure chamber time and all of that as any man alive. And all of it really was to learn what, what we should know but it never was done as it is now in a very formal academic way as it is for astronauts and pilots and all of that. And frankly, if you had a medical problem in those days, you just kept it to yourself. You, you, uh, we became pretty expert at that. <laughs> By today's standards, the first X-15 simulator was crude. It wasn't designed to give any physical sensation of flight. Its purpose was to display accurate instrument responses to control inputs, which was valuable training in a mission on which the pilot would rarely get a chance to take his eyes off the panel. I believe very strongly in a simulator at that stage to learn procedures and to learn systems and had a lot of disagreement with people who said I should practice in the simulator a couple, three hours before every flight. I didn't want to do that because we really didn't know what the X-15's characteristics were and I didn't want to learn a lot of bad habits. I would rather be confronted with it as an airplane rather than have to put aside things that I had uh, learned as uh, the dynamics of flight is what I didn't want to learn from a simulator. There was another form of simulator available to the first X-15 pilots. If the Lockheed F-104 was configured properly, using flaps and extended landing gear to increase drag, landing approaches roughly similar to those predicted for the X-15 could be flown. The opportunity was offered to Scott Crossfield. And I'd never flown an F-104 before, and the guys at Edwards, who for an F-104 flight program thought I was crazy. Well, I was. I wasn't about to let anybody get the door open on getting into my, <laughs> into my cockpit on the X-15. And now I have the privilege of pressing the button, which will bring out the plus. 
When X-15 number one rolled out on October 15, 1958, Vice President Nixon called it the vehicle that regained America's lead in space. But the big XLR-99 engine was a year behind schedule, and the X-15 still had everything to prove. Although the X-15 had still not flown, the U.S. Air Force already had approval for the next phase of the piloted conquest of space. The X-20, known as the Dinosaur, would be launched into orbit by rocket and then fly back to Earth under full pilot control. It would combine the best features of the X-15's piloted approach with the speed and altitude capability of pure rocket programs like Mercury. In the summer of 1958, Congress had passed the Space Act, and just two weeks before the rollout of the first X-15, the old National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, NACA, had been replaced by a new body, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. NASA's primary objective was to put a man into space, and all space programs apart from the X-20 were placed under its control. The X-20 still belonged to the Air Force. Edwards Air Force Base was now the home of the X-15. Its test program would be carried out from the same dry lake area that had seen the testing of the first American jet and the success of the first plane to break the sound barrier. The buildings that formed the base for the X-15 program still stand at Edwards, just to the north of the main base. The bunkers in which engineers and crew sheltered during static engine tests are still there, and so are the rigs in which the X-15 was secured. Because of the delay with the XLR-99, the first X-15 was fitted with two XLR-11 engines, the same engine that had taken Chuck Yeager and the X-1 through the sound barrier more than 10 years before. The flight test program began officially on March 19, 1959, but there were delays and morale suffered. On June 8th, Scott Crossfield took off under the wing of the B-52 to try another glide flight. We flew the airplane without any propellants on board just to get its handling characteristics. In fact, it's kind of interesting. My checkout flight was three minutes and 58 seconds. And therein was where I had to learn all I had to know to land the airplane for the first time. Release. It's a clean break. Looks pretty good here. I'm at 36,000. The X-15 had a sidearm controller, a small control stick on the right of the cockpit. No one knew it wasn't set up properly. The sidearm control was designed so that you could virtually immobilize your arm just by pressing down on the armrest and just move your hand in that direction and roll your arm in that direction. So you didn't get all of this spring and mass system into the control motion. Scott, don't forget the vertical. Okay, we might like clear the edge of the lake here. Crossfield could have elected to use the joystick, but he saw no problem in deciding to try out the sidearm controller. Everything was on the numbers as I had planned it, and I asked for the nose to pitch up to flare and got into what appeared to me to be a classic static instability. Crossfield was enormously experienced. He knew he was in deep trouble. It kept pitching up. I started it down. It kept pitching down and I got into an oscillation that was pretty wide excursion and angle of attack. I'd intended to land at around 175 knots, but it wasn't until I was down about 145 knots that I got this airplane corralled so that I could get the skids on the ground at the bottom of that oscillation, or else it would, we would have bought the farm and rolled it up in the ball. You're about 30 feet. I just hold her steady and you'll settle right there. I have a trophy at home that is literally a brick ground into a streamlined shape, beautifully mounted on a plaque 
given to me by the Southern California Soaring Society. And I own the world's record for a glider for the shortest time from 38,000 feet to the ground. <laughs> the control problem was solved with a simple adjustment and it never occurred again. The next step was the first powered flight. It was to happen in the X-15 number two, also fitted with the makeshift engines. On September 17th, the X-15 was fueled up with liquid oxygen and alcohol for a flight that was not to exceed twice the speed of sound or 60,000 feet. It was to be conservative and safe. Flight preparation began in the early hours and continued through to daylight. Several powered flight attempts had already been aborted because of problems in the fuel system or the auxiliary power units. This was a highly complex airplane. Extreme care had to be taken at every stage of the process. The morning was cold and damp. The strain of delays and aborted flights was felt by everybody in the crew. Like all the rocket-powered planes since the X-1, the X-15 was a potential bomb with its explosive mixture of volatile fuels. Crossfield had an agreement that in the event of an emergency, the X-15 would be dropped to avoid potential loss of life in the B-52. When the B-52 finally began to taxi toward the end of the runway, all systems appeared to be operating as planned. Chase planes were a crucial factor in the safety of experimental flights. Joe Walker was a NASA test pilot and Major Bob White represented the Air Force. Both were designated X-15 pilots who would take over when North American fulfilled its test contract. The X-15 would be more thoroughly monitored in flight than any other airplane in history. All available technology was utilized to track every action of plane and pilot. The white rectangle on the underside of the X-15 is frosting in the shape of the fuel tank caused by the low temperature of liquid oxygen. Inside the B-52, the X-15 is carefully watched as the countdown continues. Every aspect of the plane's operation must be checked before launch. The X-15 is dropped. Crossfield fires the XLR-11 engines. He ignites all eight chambers. The X-15 is under power for the first time. Got eight of them going. Roger. Heading uphill at 33,000 feet. Roger. Looks good across the board. And I'm on number one and climbing through 35. The first power flight went well. Of course, I knew those engines very well, and I knew what to anticipate from them and how to make them go. I must have over 100 flights with that LR4 to 11 engines. The second flight went well. The third flight, a problem that had been lurking in that engine for 30 years showed up. And it was just, it, it just took a coincidence of a fraction of a second in things not sequencing properly and it blew the back end out of the airplane, and that's when I put it on Rosamond. When Crossfield heard a fire warning, he began to jettison fuel, heading for Rosamond Dry Lake near Edwards. But when he hit the lake bed, the remaining fuel made him nose heavy. The airplane broke just exactly at the loads that it should break, and it was due to a nose wheel problem. 
on that flight. So there was two separate failures that day, one in the engine and one in breaking in two. The back of the plane was completely broken, but within three months, it would be flying again. By March 1960, the big XLR-99 engine was ready, and reaction motors delivered two of them. One was installed in the number three plane, which was delivered to Edwards for static tests. On June 8, 1960, it was placed in the static test stand for its first firing. Scott Crossfield was in the cockpit. It's always very interesting, you know, that I get in the airplane and everybody else gets in blockhouses, you know, that's what they call uh, building the confidence of the pilot. <laughs> The blockhouse was a shelter for the ground monitoring staff, and on this day, they needed it. Well, I've always said it's the biggest bang I'd ever heard, and it blew the center part of the airplane, not the center, the cockpit and the instrument bay, forward about maybe 20 feet. And we calculated probably it's about 150 Gs and I got a sore neck out of it, and I do believe that's what happened to my eyes because it was some two or three months later I began having difficulty seeing it at night, you know, as it, when your eyes are dilated. It wasn't the fault of the engine. A pressure relief valve failure had caused the liquid oxygen tank to explode. The only effect on Crossfield was the change in his eyesight. And that's why I began wearing the dark glasses. You know, all fighter pilots wear big watches and dark glasses, and uh, nobody thinks much of it. You know, I couldn't see. <laughs> and I sure as hell wasn't going to tell anybody because that would cost me the program. By early 1960, NASA's Joe Walker and the Air Force's Bob White were in the final stages of their preparation to start the government's test program. Scott Crossfield had made his only powered flight in the number one plane in January 1960, flying it to almost 1,700 miles an hour and 70,000 feet. He appears to have enjoyed every second of it. Looking real good from back here. And they look very good across the door. Looking good. But it was Crossfield's last time in this particular saddle. After the flight, North American handed the number one plane over to the government. In June 1960, X-15 number two was delivered with the XLR-99 engine. By the time it was ready for flight testing in November, the program had been running for more than a year. At last, Crossfield could fly the X-15 as its designers intended. I flew over the speed range and demonstrated that the engine could be started and stopped and that it would accelerate and the fuel would scavenge and that the throttleability was there. I was limited initially to Mach 2, but there was no way you could, you could hold it to Mach 2 by contract. And so they let it out to Mach 3. And I, the first flight that they did that, I, I pushed it so the Mach meter went past three because I wasn't about to let anybody claim that one. And that never was published. <laughs> After two flights with the big engine, Crossfield had done his job. He had proved the plane on behalf of the contractor, North American. The X-15's vast potential was still to be explored. And I, I nurtured secret hopes that I could bring it back to the committee and do the research program. But that was, uh, I knew that maybe, you know, once you quit the club, you're not going to be brought back in. And uh, I had deserted the ranks, so to speak. And also, uh, it would have not been good to have a one-man airplane. We were trying to demonstrate that this was technology, not, not, a, not a stunt and that sort of thing. The number three plane, rebuilt after the explosion in the test stand, emerged in late 1961. It was designed to specialize in high altitude flights and featured a control system that automatically transitioned for flight inside and outside the atmosphere. The first two planes in the hands of Joe Walker and the growing team of NASA and Air Force test pilots had by this time broken every existing speed and altitude record. Joe Walker had flown the number one plane at 3,900 miles an hour, and then Bob White pushed number two past 4,000.
On April 30th, 1962, Joe Walker took the number one plane to an altitude of just under 250,000 feet. The number three plane, with its self-adaptive flight control system, was capable of going higher still, right to outer space. On the 17th of July, 1962, the B-52 took off with Major Bob White in the cockpit of the X-15 number three. In June, he had equaled Joe Walker's altitude record. Today, he was making man's first attempt to fly into space and back. Propelled in a ballistic trajectory by the great thrust of the XLR-99, the flight peaked at a point 59.6 miles above the Earth. The X-15 was in outer space. Bob White could see all the way from San Francisco to Mexico. He could see the curvature of the Earth. He had become the X-15's first astronaut. The next day at a White House ceremony, Bob White, Joe Walker, and Scott Crossfield were presented with American Aviation's most prestigious award, the Collier Trophy. It was presented by President John F. Kennedy. In November 1962, Air Force test pilot Jack McKay was making a low-altitude, low-speed flight to study stability and control without the X-15-2's ventral fin. Soon after drop, it became clear that something was wrong with the engine. Push your throttle up and give us chamber pressure. Uh, we don't have to take a about 200. Roger, you got the full throttle? Okay. You're running at 30%. The XLR-99 was producing only 30% of its power. There was no alternative but to abort the flight and attempt an emergency landing on nearby Mud Lake. McKay was badly injured, but alive. It took four hours to get him out of the cockpit, but he would recover to fly the X-15 again. There were now several new test pilots on the program. Before any of them took their place in the cockpit of an X-15, they went through rigorous preparation. The simulator was now much more sophisticated than the one Scott Crossfield had used. And for new pilot Milt Thompson, it was a satisfying and accurate representation of what to expect from the real thing. But the simulator still gave no idea of the physical sensation. However thorough the preparation, the prospect of a real flight in an X-15 was daunting. you knew you were gonna be on the ground within eight to 10 minutes, one way or the other. You were either gonna have made a successful landing or come down on a parachute or made a smoking hole, one or the other. Mel Thompson made his first flight in October 1963. In spite of simulator training, the performance surprised him. You just try to keep up, you know, it's happening so fast. Uh, the whole flight depends on how well you perform in the first 82 seconds because that's how long the engine burns. And so the success of the mission is established right there and you're just trying like hell to keep up. For new pilot Joe Engel, there were some unexpected flight characteristics. As the airplane would heat up and as you got to that point where dynamic pressure was getting very high and the airplane was getting very, very sensitive and you could tell it was just, just like milk in a nervous mouse. You just didn't want to make any motions that you really didn't have to at all. Um, this nearly quarter inch steel on the side would oil can, just like a can does when you sit it out on your driveway in the sun and it would go, go wham. And, and uh, I know Bob Brushworth uh, 
told me and and warned me about it, uh, you know, ahead of the flight, uh, that he knew that I was going to go into that flight regime, that, that speed envelope. And uh, even knowing it was going to happen, every time that it happened, it was uh, a real, uh, it really gets your attention. The thing that you tried to do was to keep the aircraft attitude fairly constant other than what you needed to change to accomplish uh, the mission for that flight. You didn't want to get the airplane moving in any axis other than the one that you were primarily concerned with because uh, once you got some rate started, uh, the rate would continue until you stopped it again. In other words, as you go over the top, uh, you may have a minus five degree pitch attitude, a left five degrees, and a right five degree roll, uh, whatever the attitude requirements are, and you must maintain those while the experiment does its thing. Then after the experiment is over, then you go back to uh, normal and coordinated flight and set up for a re-entry and uh, make the re-entry and a glide back to Edwards in a normal landing. Coming up on 20,000 now. Okay, I know you've done it, but check your flaps and circuit breakers. Right here. Right. Ready to go pressurize? Pressurize. You're in good shape. Not every flight was a record flight, and obviously there was an awful lot of just very good, solid engineering and aerodynamic and aerothermodynamic data that was retrieved from the X-15 program. And I recognized that and tried as hard as I could to fly as accurate a profile as I was given, so that the data that I brought back was as applicable to what was desired and, and could be compared with the uh, theoretical data that they wanted to look at as possible. And, and it was so satisfying to slide out on the lake bed after a flight, uh, particularly one that not anything had gone wrong and you really knew that all the data that you brought back was exactly what the engineers were looking to get from that particular flight. In February 1964, the rebuilt number two X-15 was delivered. It was now called the A-2 and was potentially the fastest X-15 of all. What we were initially doing was expanding the envelope of the basic X-15 out to Mach 8. Now, the airplane was capable of going there. The only thing that limited us was the fact that we were out of fuel. And so we added fuel. We added two external tanks to the airplane. Now, that meant that we could probably get to those Mach numbers, or at least approach those Mach numbers, but that meant also that we were going to be at those high speeds for a lot longer period of time. That meant that the temperatures on that airplane were going to exceed the design limits of the airplane, so we had to cover the airplane with an ablative material. That coating was designed to burn away at high speeds and keep temperatures down. It was a pink material, and uh, I think I said that I'm not going to fly a pink airplane. But that really wasn't the reason. The, the reason was that that material, again, was kind of like a pencil of er eraser. And, it, and if it got into the systems in the airplane, it could cause problems. So to give it a little bit more of a structural integrity, we painted it with a white paint so that we could calm it down a little bit and allow the technicians to work on the airplane during pre-flight and post-flight. There was another peculiarity that was associated with that material, that as you got to the high speed portion of the flight, that material ablated, charred, emitted gases, whatever it did, but whatever it did, that material came back and stuck on the windows, and it made the windows opaque. So that meant that as we went out to the high Mach numbers, then I wouldn't have any visibility when I came back to land, so we corrected that, we put a an eyelid on the left window. And so for launch, I had the right window to look out of if I needed any uh, outside visibility. I would proceed to the high Mach numbers and that window then would become opaque. And as I slowed down below Mach two or three, I could open the left eyelid and it would be a clear window and I would hope that the lake bed would be on the left side and make a left pattern and land. Just before the X-15A2 rolled out, the follow-on program, the X-20, 
was canceled in favor of the development of manned rockets and the manned orbiting laboratory. The X-15 was now alone as a development vehicle capable of flying to space and back under pilot control. But the mission of the A-2 was pure speed. And after a thorough testing program, on November 18, 1966, Pete Knight established an unofficial world absolute speed record of Mach 6.33, or 4,250 miles an hour. On October 3, 1967, Knight set out in the A-2 again with a newly applied ablative coating. His mission was to reach the X-15's maximum speed carrying a dummy scramjet, a new form of power plant for future high-speed, high-altitude flight. 67 seconds after launch, the fuel in the external tanks would be consumed and they would drop away, allowing the X-15 to accelerate out to maximum speed. There is a, a, a sensation of speed. Uh, you know that you're pushing the airplane. It's, I think, akin to, to driving a car. You can drive a car around at 70, 80 miles an hour, and it's, it's rather comfortable. If you push that same car to, say, 100 miles an hour or 110, you know that you're pushing the, the limits of that, that car. I think the X-15 was in the same category as you begin to go above Mach 6 and you begin to push out farther and farther in the envelope. I think we were well aware of the fact that you know, things are getting a, a little bit uh, more critical. As we went out to 6.5, 6.7, you were aware of speed. And uh, if you looked outside, as I had a chance to do fleetingly you know, from time to time, uh, you knew that you were moving across the ground and uh, even at 100,000 feet you were very much aware of, uh, of the speed, and even more so aware of the speed in terms of the, of the time of the flight and the amount of, of uh, effort and the amount of uh, uh, experiments that had to be done during uh, that portion of the flight. It was a busy flight. Uh, there was not much time for looking around or joyriding. Pete Knight had reached a speed of Mach 6.7, 4,520 miles an hour, an unofficial absolute speed record for winged aircraft in the atmosphere. But as he brought the X-15A2 in for a landing, he had no idea it had flown for the last time. Everything worked well as far as I could see, but when I got back down on the lake bed, Normally, everybody comes to the front of the airplane, congratulates me on a flight, and helps me get out of the airplane. This time, that didn't happen. Everybody went to the back of the airplane, and I said, there's something wrong. So I got out of the airplane, went around and looked at the back end of the airplane, and the, the scramjet had burnt off. Uh, the lower ventral had sustained considerable damage due to high temperatures. It was like you took a blowtorch into the lower ventral and it melted the material away, got up into the engine bay, cut some of the stainless steel lines so that I was unable to jettison the, the remaining fuel after I got back. And so it was a heavyweight landing, I, I knew that. And also the flaps didn't work because heat got up into the flap motors. And uh, so there were some of those things that, that we would have had to work out for the next flight. But we knew what the problems were, we knew why it happened, and we felt very confident that we could have corrected those problems and we could have continued on our build-up program out to Mach 8 or VMAX, whatever the, the final Mach number would be. But it was not to happen. The cost of restoring the plane to flying condition was beyond the program's budget. The A-2 retired to the Air Force Museum in Dayton. The last A-2 flight was number 188 in the program. 200 were planned. The other two airplanes continued to fly. On November 15, 1967, test pilot Mike Adams took off for a routine altitude mission in the number three plane. C-130 
Soon after ignition, things began to go wrong. An electrical disturbance interrupted communication and caused damage to the adaptive flight control system. This was no major problem at low altitudes, but just before engine shutdown, the continuing electrical disturbance caused a problem with the flight computer. The instruments began to show faulty information. Adams tried to follow the flight plan and thought he was doing it, but the ground control crew monitoring the flight began to realize the maneuvers the plane was going through were wrong. Problems began to accumulate, and confusion about what was actually happening in the plane caused mounting concern in the control room. Then Adams reported he was in a spin, something unknown in the X-15. He tried everything possible to recover. As Mike uh, re-entered the atmosphere and as the airplane recovered from the spin, the gains in the control system were locked up at 100%, and they did not function from then on. So as he began to get deeper and deeper into the atmosphere and, and the Q, or the density of the air, began to increase, the gains were much too high. The motions of the plane became more and more violent, and the X-15 began to experience extreme G-forces. There was nothing the ground crew could do to help Mike Adams solve the situation. Just prior to breakup, uh, it went through about uh, one and a half to two cycles at plus or minus somewhere above 18 Gs in pitch, and probably plus or minus eight or nine Gs laterally. And that's what broke up the airplane. And he, he never had a chance uh, once that started. The X-15 was descending at a rate of 160,000 feet a minute. At 67,000 feet, the fuselage buckled. Because of the high dynamic forces, Major Adams was unable to eject. I think the feeling is that he had vertigo so bad that he never knew what the displays were telling him. And every time he made an input, the display moved in the right direction. But the airplane was not doing what he thought it was doing. X-15 number three broke up in the air. Major Mike Adams was killed. The number one plane was now left to finish the X-15 program alone. On October 24, 1968, Bill Dana made the last flight. It's been called one of the most successful research airplane programs that uh, we ever conducted. And I still believe that, you know, 30 years later, uh, it's still probably the most impressive program that we've done. I think it was uh, one of the most successful research airplanes that uh, the Air Force and NASA ever put together and ever had a cooperative effort in flying. Uh, the data that will come out of that airplane and that program will be used for years and years. I personally would rank very, very high the development of the flight control system to fly exo-atmospheric and then transition back into the atmosphere uh, as one of, the, one of the really great achievements that the X-15 did. If we had continued with the orbital X-15, it would have been the research airplane's natural step right on up the line and we would not be worrying about space stations today they would be up there and a facile way to get to that space station and back would have evolved out of the orbital x-15 and out of its ramjet scramjet program would have come a whole new generation of advanced propulsion systems which would have had a tremendous impact on history One hundred and ninety-nine flights were made in the X-15 program. For the space shuttle, and for whatever winged vehicles may follow, looking to fly across the threshold of space and back, its legacy is immense. <laughs>